Hi, we're Chelsea and Tony, and this is our podcast, Picture This, and today's episode is Photographers You Should Know, Part 2. So we already did an episode like this. A lot of people loved it, but said, hey, why didn't you include this person or that person? Or yeah, we so included we'll do a few more people. Bios of three well-known photographers or just photographers that we think are significant enough that you should know about them a little bit. But first... This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas and your portfolio. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony and enter the coupon code portfolio. portfolio, and that will get you 10% off. If you don't want to buy it, you can just go there. No credit card needed. Get uh, a portfolio for 14 days for free. Get a website 14 days for free and try it out. We recommend it because it's just good to go through your pictures. Yeah, every every photographer, beginner or advanced, should should be keeping a portfolio, and Squarespace is the best way to do that. So, who's our first photographer, Chelsea? Mary Ellen Mark. She's wonderful. Tell me about her. Well, she started photography when she was nine with a box brownie camera. I think that's just the, like Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams started with that yep, camera as well. Um, and she had a pretty traditional beginning. She got her bachelor's degree from UPenn uh, in painting and art history. She got a job for a little while, went back to school and got her master's in photojournalism. As soon as she picked up a camera, she realized she wanted to do photojournalism. People asked her about that, and she just said, it wasn't like I decided one day. It's just what I was drawn to, mm -hmm. and I realized that it was something I had to do. That's what she said. Uh, so while she was in school, she got sent to Turkey on a Fulbright scholarship for a year, and she traveled around. She went to other countries in Europe taking pictures and reporting what she saw. She made her first book, Passport, from that experience. Oh, great. Why I think you should know Mary Ellen Mark She's a great photographer, you know, first and foremost. But something that I realized while researching her more is that she makes you realize that photography is so much more important than just taking the picture. She draws you into her subjects and she makes you empathetic for them. Mm -hmm. And she has this incredible talent for not only finding a subject, but just being humbled by them. She has a really unique personality because she'll find people that she wants to represent people that she wants to give a voice and she can actually listen when she's taking her pictures she's not trying to convey a message she's letting her subjects speak to the camera mm -hmm. and there's this mutual respect that's really important so her photography is important and it's special and it's good but her relationship with her subjects is also really notable i just thought that that was something that we had never really taught before it's not a lesson you read in blogs photography blogs what are the camera settings for that well that's kind of my point is that when you're learning photography you learn about settings and you learn about composition and there's there's so much more to it than that you really have to put yourself into it you have to put who you are as a person into it yeah especially as a photojournalist you could pretty much just use automatic settings as long as you got the exposure and some workable image it's more about actually being where the event is happening and but also connecting getting access to, and and allowing people to show real emotions and i think it's about your intentions too i think that shows through in your pictures and she said i feel an affinity for people who haven't had the best breaks in society what i want to do more than anything is acknowledge their existence and i thought about that quote and there's so many times when people are walking down the street and there's a homeless person and you look away it's ugly mm -hmm. or you see something that you don't like and you look away and she has this incredible quiet strength to go into these places and to take pictures of things that maybe people don't want to see. So here we have a picture titled Bathing Boys from India taken in 1980. And, and there's three boys in the picture and uh, one of them is holding a hose on the other from behind and just hosing him down. But he seems kind of shocked by the cold by the water. Cold water. Yeah. So he's kind of gasping for air. But overall, it, he's it seems right like at a, the camera. A, a really happy picture. Yeah, there's a direct connection. But part of the reason I chose this picture, it's a great picture, but it also makes you realize just how intimate of a moment it is. Mm -hmm. She's inside with these three boys. They they trust her. And they're not posing. So often, even if you try to grab a candid picture of somebody in the street, you end up getting a forced smile or a little bit of discomfort. And the slightest change in the expression makes or breaks a picture. Yeah. And yeah, she's comfortable with these people. I would love to, to know how long she spent with them and how she went about getting them comfortable well these this next photo it's of 
it's titled Young Prostitute Crying in Olympia Cafe, and it's of a young girl, and she's got her face in the crook of her arm over the back of a chair. And to be clear, for those listening, she doesn't look like a prostitute. No, she, she looks like a little girl. She has a shawl on. Yeah, it looks like a, a, a little a young Indian girl dressed in mostly traditional garb. So to answer your question, she spent three months befriending the prostitutes who worked on this one street in Bombay. And this is a picture that I could show, but she actually has very intimate pictures of the prostitutes nude with their johns and they're making eye contact with the camera. And the, the courage that it would take to put yourself in that position mm -hmm. And the amount of trust that you'd have to have from these people to be that vulnerable, I just think it speaks volumes to who she is as a person. Um, when she's interviewed, she'd say things like, y you have this urge to go in and change things, and you're very humbled because you realize that you might not be able to change them. She doesn't try to be a saint. She doesn't say, I changed the world with my picture. She just says, maybe that's not true. Maybe I can't change everything. But what I can do is give these people a voice and I can tell their story and I can show the truth of their situation. An example of that is um, this documentary that she did called Streetwise. Now she would go out and she would take a bunch of pictures and kind of go on these these different projects like the one in Bombay and uh, her Fulbright in Turkey. But she published 18 books of collections of pictures. And, you know, she was highly regarded. She won countless awards. She won the 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award in Photography from the George Eastman House, and she won the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award three times. So people really respected her work. Um, but she also was an associate producer of a major motion picture called The American Heart, and she also did film documentaries as well as photojournalism. So she did this documentary called Streetwise about Seattle street life. And she went out and she, I don't want to say befriended, but she became familiar with these, this group of kids, especially this girl you can see here, tiny. And she didn't just go out into the street, snap pictures of these kids for a few days, you know, kind of like feed off of their story by taking pictures. She stayed with them for a long time and she gave them her number and she asked them to reach out. Um, Tiny was a 13 year old prostitute and she had her first child when she was 15, but she was really sweet. I watched the documentary just to get an idea of her work and it was incredibly mu moving and just really illuminating and powerful. Um, and you could see how much she cared about these kids to follow them around and take the time to tell their story. Tiny, she she actually invited Tiny to live with her and her husband in New York and said, you can live with us, but there's one thing. You have to go to school. And she said, no. She's, and Mary Ellen said, Tiny, she was a free spirit. She's independent. She would rather be out on her own. So she turned me down, but she tried. But um, the documentary was so powerful that Life magazine wrote about it. And it kind of put the spotlight on this problem of homeless kids, homeless teens, and the things that they were forced to do to survive and the reasons that they were put on the street, alcoholic parents or abusive parents uh, or parents that just abandoned them. So she didn't give herself a lot of credit. She never said, I changed this or I helped these people. Um, but I really do think that she did because people were writing about it. And uh, it is controversial because to capture something, people immediately think you should also fix it. We've run into this theme studying other photographers before, and some of them it's even driven the photographers to suicide, partially at least because so many people said, oh, you took a picture of something awful, why didn't you fix it? But you don't always have that option. And, and the more you intervene with your subject, the more you push them away. You lose access to them. It's, it's just not always an option to change things. And, and in fact, it's an accomplishment just to be able to capture it and observe it and share that. Yeah, and she did. I think that if you are trying to change things, you're in a way casting judgment, which was part of what made her so successful. She didn't go to these kids and say, or, never mind, or, I took my picture, never mind, like you need to get cleaned up and go home. And, you know, she didn't impose yeah. her views on them. She was there to observe and to hear them, not to preach to them what they, what she thought they were supposed to do. And I think that that's part of what made her really successful. So she went back, you can see Tiny on the left here, I think she's about 13 to 15 here. And then on the right, 
she has she's grown and has 10 kids yeah and if you're you're listening to the to the audio podcast there's a dramatic transformation yeah at 13 she's she's young and thin and uh, how old is she in the after picture i I don't know yeah well she said she has 10 kids yeah (laughs) so certainly 10 years have passed um but she's definitely lost that that youthful look and the 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 change that uh, mary ellen captured is dramatic I really encourage our listeners and viewers to watch the documentary Streetwise. Streetwise. Yeah, and you'll see Tiny and you'll fall in love with her too. She's There's something really sweet and spunky and resilient and, and likable about her. Just to show, I just thought that these pictures also showed how close she was to people and, mm-hmm. and her great gift for capturing people in an intimate moment. Um, she also worked with people in a circus in India. So we have a picture here of a man with his elephant and a guy with his birds, but they're just really great shots. Yeah, the the elephant has the elephant's trunk wrapped around uh, the the owner's kind of neck, but not in a violent way and more of like a sweet way. Yeah. They seem to have a really close connection. And and you see that same connection with the bird keeper and his maybe a macaw that he's wrapped his arm around and he has kind of nuzzled up against him. Yeah. (laughs) Resting. It's, It's just really sweet connections between animals and humans. So I, I just to reiterate the reason that I chose her, her photography is incredibly powerful. That was the first thing that drew me to her. But as I researched her, I chose her for the pod- podcast because I think that there's there are other elements you have to consider as a photographer that maybe aren't so easy to teach when we are writing our books or making our tutorials or doing our camera reviews. And I think part of that is what is your intention? Do you, do you just want to get likes on Facebook? Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's going to cut it if you're exploiting people for that reason. I think you have to have a deeper purpose and you have to have a respect for your subjects. And I think that that is part of what made Mary Ellen so great. Up next is Yuri Arkurs, a stock photographer. And he's probably the single most published photographer ever. <laughs> he has a ton of pictures, yeah. Yeah, I, I was it. unable to find anybody who'd publish more photos. And uh, because we know his work, we it recognize it everywhere. You go into Target, and one of those pictures is probably taken by him. And you flip through a magazine, pictures by Yuri. Yeah. You look at a website. There's a picture in the corner of somebody eating an apple. It was taken by Yuri. So we stumbled upon Yuri because we were getting into stock photography Maybe just even a few years after he started. Yeah, he started in in 2005, and I think we started in 2008. And yeah. and stock photography had been around for a long time. This is more technically micro stock photography. Micro stock photography came about in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, and it was basically websites that would sell people the rights to use images cheaply. So before you would have to go to uh, why am I blanking on the names of Getty? Them? Getty. Yeah, you'd go to Getty and you spend five hundred dollars on an image or something yeah. like that. And so, Microstock sites like iStock, Fotolia, Shutterstock cropped up, and they would sell you an image for a couple of dollars. But the pictures $5. were often terrible. They were often terrible. And then Yuri comes along, and, and Yuri starts by taking terrible pictures. That's true. His first pictures <laughs> were not good. Yeah, let's. Look, I'll look at a couple of his pictures. Uh, I also want to introduce his now wife, his then girlfriend in 2005, uh, Cecile. Uh, And she's, they're inseparable, I think, as far as tracking their entire business model. Well, part of the reason they were such a great inspiration to us is they were another team that worked as a couple. Right. And they worked really well together. And uh, they're, they're both from Denmark and they look it. Yeah, they're beautiful <laughs> like, people. They're both like tall and thin and blonde. And that's almost kind of perfect for somebody getting into stock photography. And and I don't know if it's because of Yuri or if Yuri lucked out, but sort of this high key look in photography is in, in stock photography is common, like almost all white photos. Yeah. Uh, with the background white and even the subject with light skin and light hair, it just tends to look good on a white page. But he or diversifies on a white as well. He does have a lot of diversity, but in in the beginning, I it think was all Cecile. it it definitely yeah. helped that he had this. So we've introduced Yuri and Cecile. Let's take a look at this is one of his very first pictures that he uploaded in 2005. And what we're That's looking fun. at is an abstract photo yeah. of a laptop computer 
on a desk with two hands and it's wearing a jacket. This is actually good compared to the other stock photography we were oh, seeing at the oh, time. Oh, yes. It, he, it's good. It's not, yeah. he would reject this photo patently now. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't fit into his work, but it's a solid stock photo. And this is what kind of stock photography is. It's this kind of abstract thing and, and conceptual thing. And so you look at this photo and your brain doesn't need to process it. It's a guy using a computer. Mm -hmm. And he could be doing online dating or he could be checking the weather or he could be writing his resume. Well, he's wearing a business suit, so he's probably doing... Well, you're right. So little things like the jacket that he's wearing tells it adds a lot to the story. Yeah. And so you're right. It would not be online dating. He would probably go sleeveless and just show his, yeah. his forearms or something like that. Um, but that's what stock photography is. And, and Yuri uploaded this picture... 11 years ago in 2005, right when stock photography was micro stock photography was starting to take off and he sold some copies of it and yeah. made a little bit of money, but he wasn't otherwise a working photographer. He didn't have big studios. He was a dude studying psychology who had a girlfriend and lived in a small house, but he happened to have a camera and he thought he would give it a shot. So that's kind of his origin story. And here's another one of his very early stock photos. This is Cecile, his girlfriend at the time. Again, using a laptop, probably the same laptop. The laptop does not have the signature Dell or Apple logo on the back that's been Photoshopped out or covered up because you can't show logos and stuff in stock yeah. photography. It yeah. would be not legal, but she's just on a park bench. And so you, she's wearing a hat. You get the feeling it's cold and she's doing some kind of work. And it, there are flaws in the picture. It's not his perfectly clean style that he's adopted yeah, now. Yeah, let's show him. Um, it's great. I love his work. And just just more of his kind of early work, you can see pictures of Cecile just kind of preparing food in the kitchen and then close-ups of keyboards where for some reason the keyboard has three keys that show WWW. Yeah. <laughs> like no keyboard well, would it's have three copies so he's, of W. He's, he's playing with this conceptual stuff, yeah. Yeah, and so that's what stock photography is. It's this very conceptual thing. You look at a keyboard that says WWW and your brain thinks the web. Yeah. Your brain doesn't think, who messed up that keyboard? No, yeah. <laughs> like the, it just Im implants this idea without you actively looking at it. And and so this is a little bit later, just a couple of months after he started. And it's it's a close-up of Cecile's mouth yeah. with uh, a, a mic, a boom mic that goes out to her chin. But mm -hmm. all you see is the tip of her nose down to her chin and, and a boom mic. you just think customer support. Right. Yeah. And now he's starting to kind of simplify his work even in the first couple of months. Yeah, he's refining his storytelling. Yep, and it's also bright. It's on a white background. It's not perfect, but it probably sold well, and so it kind of got that encouraging, uh, well, money, okay. <laughs> I guess. This next photo is from 2007, and, and I chose to show it because I flipped through his pictures until I found a picture that I recognized that we still see. Yeah. And so this picture, even though it was at least two years into stock photography, he, at the time, I think he only had maybe 50 or 100 pictures in his portfolio. Now he has thousands and thousands and thousands. But this one is the first one that I recognize as being popular. And so it's, again, it's Cecile and she's on a beach and the, the beach is, is nice and perfect and there's blue water and blue sky and she's wearing a white bikini. Big space for, for some text too. Right. Really important. There's a big space. So yeah. These are all factors that photographers don't think about, but they're critical for stock photography. Simple concepts. Uh, clear spaces to write text and mm -hmm. flexible layouts for the designers. Um, so fast forward a little bit, he keeps taking pictures of Cecile. He starts bringing in other models and he, he also starts to evolve a style. And these are his more recent photos. And these are a collection of different fo fo photos of people wearing business suits and they're all gathered around a laptop yeah. computer and they're in various stages of pointing to the laptop computer and yeah, discussing like a things. meeting or, yeah. You know. it, it says meeting right away. But yeah. So some of Yuri's signature style that evolved from, from over those years is, is a very bright, out of focus background. There's nothing dark or uh, contrasty in the background. The background's very washed out and definitely in like the right third of the histogram, but also distinctly out of focus. Mm -hmm. There's just a little, it's not pure white background. There's a little hint of the environment. So you can tell they're in maybe an upscale office. Yeah, whereas usually a lot of stock is done just on a white backdrop, which makes it easy for the photographer, but it seems unnatural in execution. You wouldn't really want it on a billboard or something necessarily. Yeah. But because it is nice and bright, you could blend it into a web page and yeah. it wouldn't you wouldn't see harsh edges right, right. or anything like that. Um, everybody has a very natural smile. And this has always been a big deal to to Yuri and Cecile. You can put anybody in front of a camera and tell them to smile, but most people's smiles will not look natural. 
all of Yuri's models have a very natural smile. Yeah. Even though I know from from trying to learn study his work, I know that he tells the models to freeze. So he doesn't just try to get them to laugh. And the reason for that is if they were to naturally laugh, they would be moving and that would reduce the sharpness of his images. And he's meticulous about getting he sharp is. and perfect images. So he spends several days with each of his models just training them. And one of the things he does is teaches them to get a natural smile and to hold it while you take a picture. And it's so hard to do. Even the best, and not, not everybody could ever do it. He combs through many models to be able to find some people who have that natural smile and who can freeze. And then he, he works with them and he combines them in different settings and he, he puts them in a business suit yeah. and a bikini so and workout gear. he develops a style to his pictures, a style to his models, and he's a perfectionist about, you know, all the settings and... Yeah, and there's also a style to his post-processing. Yeah. So doing things like blowing out the background a little bit, blurring it, reducing the clarity of things in the background, and, and probably many secrets that I have no idea about. Yeah, I'm sure. He's just, he's excellent at what he does. Um, so now, at, at least the last record I could find, he was selling, saying that he's selling 4 million pictures a year, which I think is a picture every eight seconds. Well, he blew our minds because we were, we learned a lot of our photography from stock because you learn about making a concept and telling a, a story simply. Mm -hmm. uh, and just technically you have to be very perfect. Your pictures can't have chromatic aberration or, you know, be out of focus or anything like that. And he was blowing our mind because he was just squashing everyone else he was just outselling everyone and mm -hmm. his pictures were just leaps and bounds better than everyone he was growing at an incredible rate so he's done so well for himself yeah in in the interim he he took he started he was making a profit on pictures mm -hmm. so we could arrange a photo shoot and sell it for some sort of profit but he made a business out of that yeah he got better gear he built a huge studio and with you know a dozen different little sets, like the size of a big gymnasium with a kitchen set and an office set. And he would bring models in and then walk them from one set to another, working in the kitchen, working in an office, uh, talking with their kid, whatever. And that way he could maximize his time with each individual model. So much of his success has been around workflow, which isn't something we talk about a lot with photographers. Yeah. <laughs> like Mary Ellen didn't have a fantastic workflow. She couldn't turn out hundreds of pictures in a day. But Yuri will do that. He will turn out a hundred pictures a in a day. I think yeah. he was like a Marine or something, right? Or he was in the military. Yeah, he Not served in the military yeah. and yeah, he got a couple of degrees. He's a scientist and a mathematician, basically. Like, you kind of hate him because he's like beautiful and brilliant and like creative and talented you're like save some for the rest of us yeah he does make all the rest of us look bad yeah uh so this particular picture that i'm showing is a stock photo where cecile is giving out a thumbs up it's it's a classic stock photo that we've all seen a yeah. hundred times even if you don't notice it i just wanted to show one of the spots that i found it ended up which is an article on the web titled why women support the quick extender pro if you can just imagine what the quick extender pro would be it's for yeah it's for it's for for gentlemen who wish that they could extend gentlemanly parts of their body some more wow. anyway it's completely silly that cecile who is now acting as the She's head like, of yeah, hr and recruitment yeah for She's this like very important business woman. their business now yuri's personal business has a hundred employees holy moly yeah 20 in denmark and 80 in south africa so they're a major operation i don't know certainly millions and millions of dollars and she's the the husband of the head and she's, she's herself in charge of yeah. recruiting and everything and here she is on a boner ad holding out a thumbs up and that is kind of the silly part of stock photography stock you photography. never know where you're going to end up can't have an ego that's for sure um and and they don't they seem to have a total sense of humor about it and i have total respect for them again yuri and cecile cecile probably the most published photographers and i bet nobody here would have previously known their names but now that you know what they look like you will definitely see I cecile wanted to everywhere interview him and he responded but i can't remember exactly what it, I, I shouldn't repeat it because it was in a private email anyway but he well, was very polite but he had some feelings yeah the, the, the fact is stock photography gets absolutely no respect uh, and and people only mock it because it is silly. Well, people mock bad stock photography, and also yeah. the people that mock it are people on the outside that don't 
know how the industry works mm -hmm. so it can look ridiculous if it's not used properly or if it's not a good picture but, yeah. yeah but basically it's it's you don't make stock photography for a specific client or a specific purpose you yeah. make it and then you put it out there and you hope somebody finds it useful so you're anticipating the needs of designers who will be looking for something to spill fill a spot and just convey a feeling yeah and it's it's a completely different type of photography from just about everything else. It's a discipline and it's hard for So I want to know more. That's all I got. That's all you know, got? What else do you want to know? I know something else about him. Okay. He has a photography boot camp. That's true, he does. And I was like, I would join that. He, he just seems incredibly disciplined and you have to dedicate, I think, a couple of weeks, maybe two or three weeks, sign up, drop everything you're doing, go there, and he will like drill into you how to do this type of photography. Yeah, I found that fascinating because he just keeps expanding. He he's an incredibly ambitious person, as is Cecile, but they just keep expanding their profession. So why did you think that he was so important to share? Just curious. Because I think he's the most published photographer of all time, and I don't think anybody knows who he is really. <laughs> I also think he's kind of a fascinating subject because he took something, um, he took micro stock, which nobody was really doing that well in, and he just turned it into his whole separate business. He has his own stock company now. That's true. Yeah, he sold through iStock and Fotolia and Shutterstock, and most of that's down now. Now he he's only selling through, I think, it's peopleimages.com, uh, yeah. which is his own site. But Google your, your ER occurs and you'll find it. So I think a lesson there is you can make your own space. People always think, well, what should I do with photography? Just got it like Mary Ellen and like Yuri, you just do what you're drawn to and just do it better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's how they had some success. I will say there was some right place, right time for Yuri because oh, yeah. 2005 was, we. there was a period of eight years maybe when Microstock, you could make some money on it. it. It got increasingly difficult after like 2010 or so because uh, more and more Microstock sites showed up and they started competing on price. So they started offering pictures for cheaper and cheaper. And now you so can literally so get bad. pictures for 25 cents each. And then uh, they give a small share of that to the actual photographer. So maybe you get a, like a, a dime yeah, we don't <laughs> out really of a sold picture. Make a lot of money. But I, I still think it's a, so I don't think you can get Yuri Arkers rich nowadays from Microsoft. Who knows, you could be the next Yuri. Uh, yeah, but come up with your own thing and, and do as a photographer, it's, I think everybody should give it a shot. I think it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. You can get yourself published. You might not make money off of it, but just the process of getting approved will teach you a lot about it. Oh, I've ended up on the cover of several magazines from it. Yeah, you've been on Yoga Magazine, Publishers Weekly, lots yeah. of CD covers, book covers. We both have been models. Yeah. As if you also will end up being a model for your, your, your own pictures because you don't have enough models. Yeah. And it's easier when you're on the inside to be the model because you know how to convey it. Mm -hmm. You know, the types of emotions and the things that go into it. Getting the model to work right is really hard and that's what really held back our stock photography business is that we're in waterford connecticut and we didn't have a large pool of skilled models so a lot of the pictures have us in them <laughs> yeah as did Ur yuri's early work um so i love today's podcast because we have such diverse photographers we have a photojournalist we have a stock photographer and then the david la chapelle the last person i chose is david la chapelle David LaChapelle was born in Hartford, Connecticut, like an hour from where we are here. And he moved to North Carolina and he attended the North Carolina School of Arts and lived there from about nine to 14. At that point, he was being teased for being gay in North Carolina. So he ran away to New York City to be a busboy at Studio 54. You know, Studio 54, right? Yeah. And just to give you an idea, I found this picture. It would have been around 1978 when he was there, which is when Studio 54 was kind of like in its prime. Uh -huh. So I put up this picture. You can see that there are just hundreds of people on the dance floor. And then you can see what the busboy looks like. He has on like uh, very tiny gym shorts and like those <laughs> kind of knee high socks and uh -huh. nothing else for yeah. the people just listening. But like very sexy, topless type thing. So David LaChapelle... He's always interested in the arts and everything. He praised the art programs in Connecticut schools, said that he really liked them. But uh, yeah, he's in North Carolina. He's not really welcome as a gay guy. He just, not the most progressive state in the just union. He takes off. Yeah. At that time, he probably wasn't that welcome anywhere. So he takes off and he goes somewhere where he is welcome. Studio 54, 
at this time had people like Keith Richards, Chuck Berry, Liza Minnelli, Halston, the designer, and Andy Warhol. Elton John is there. All of the celebrities are going there, and here he is brushing elbows, making contacts, seeing these people. And I think it's I think it's formative. I didn't find anything uh, that said that it was formative or that he had met these people. But I have to believe that it was, because at this time he's taking pictures still, and he's doing some exhibits in New York in the in the early 80s, and he's showing at New York City galleries, and who comes along? Andy Warhol. Can you imagine that? You start your photography career, and a few years later, Andy Warhol discovers you. Mm -hmm. He's 17 years old, and Andy Warhol gives him a job for uh, a magazine called Interview Magazine, and he says, do whatever you want, just make people look good. So David LaChapelle takes pictures. People really like them. He starts getting jobs for other huge magazines, Vogue, things like that. And he starts doing a ton of commercial work and celebrity photography. Yeah, I, I have to say, as far as the actual work produced, I think David LaChapelle is my favorite photographer of all time. His images are, are bright and you'd probably describe them as glam. Yeah. They're bright and contrasty and perfect and fascinating and almost like imagine the storytelling and composition of a renaissance oil painting but well, in a photograph so his his work was really inspired by like caravaggio and a lot of painters he was interested in art history mm -hmm. and so his work was inspired by that but his early work was still kind of odd you'll see i couldn't put up a lot of his pictures there's a lot of nudity and his pictures are very odd and we try to keep it kind of family friendly, but um, you can see a picture of Lady Gaga here and she has she's naked except for some bubbles covering her. And that's kind of his classic style. Yeah, everything is very carefully staged. Let's everything be here is... clear. He's not doing photojournalism. It's all in a studio or in some other set that has been constructed usually over the period a period of weeks or months. So this he spends is, months planning these This photos. is why this is exactly why I wanted to share his work with people. I think it might be a bit polarizing, but like it or hate it, it shows how much work you can put into one picture and how much planning and how much staging. And I also love that it melds photography with kind of this classic style of paintings. If you look at this picture of Courtney Love, and this is supposed to be Kurt Cobain, laid over her lap with, you know, these marks on his wrist like he's Christ. He's kind of depicting Christ and She's the Mother Mary. That's a very famous painting. I think that this is recreating. But his pictures are so rich with symbolism. And it really harkens back to uh, like a more symbolic, richer time of art. Mm -hmm. And so he's taken all of these things that he's learned in art history and he applies them to a photograph, which is so different from anything else that we've looked at with these other photographers that we've talked about, right? So you see like landscapes and you see unposed people and then David LaChapelle comes in and he starts making people a part of like a living painting. Yeah, he has to construct the photo in three dimensions. Yeah. Like he has to if you, a painter would paint a beautiful room, yeah. LaChapelle has to build it yes. and light it and fill it with decorations and then find the right models to pose and then add the lighting to make it exactly perfect because he really he tries not to use any post processing at all. Like he tries to get it in camera. And so you look at his images and you're like, surely this is Photoshopped. Probably not. No, his it, it's insane. If you look at his pictures and just look at every little part of them, there are hundreds of stories within them and symbolism and just every little detail is perfect. Yeah, so, you can spend a long time just staring close at one of his huge prints. He's photographed so many famous people, including Andy Warhol, um, Madonna, pretty much everyone you can think of. I actually don't uh, know if Madonna was. His work with Michael Jackson is pretty amazing. I don't know if that was really Michael Jackson. Oh, really? That may have been an, we would have to look that up. Okay, maybe he fooled me, but um, regardless, it's an amazing photo. But he was so popular, you know, he shot for magazines and things, and then he started doing advertising. He shot for Coca-Cola, Comcast, Burger King, H&M, Nokia, a ton of companies. And then he started uh, producing and directing music videos and did videos for Elton John, Florence and the Machine, Britney Spears, Jennifer Lopez, no doubt. Like, just so many artists, Blink-182, just a wide variety. But you can see in his videos that he keeps his style. Mm -hmm. um, and I included this little screenshot of an Elton John video, and you, you can tell it's his work. It's not like he sold out. He yeah. just took it to a different format, and it's still 
his very strange, beautiful, uh, painterly style. But um, everybody here should should look up his work because we couldn't show you many samples of his work. And look closely at it and just think about what it would take to build the set, every single item that needed to be positioned and purchased, and, and just how you would go about taking that picture. Just try to deconstruct it. So here he was, he was in this world where he's photographing the world's most famous people, the world's richest people. He's working for the top companies and he's working himself to the bone. And he got really burnt out. So he moved to Hawaii and he was just like, I'm a farmer now. Oh, really? Is that what he's doing now? Um, no. So he's in Hawaii and he was just kind of relaxing and I think kind of looking back on his career and, and taking inventory of everything that he was doing. And a friend came to him and said, hey, will you do a show at a gallery here in Hawaii? And he thought, well, yeah, because he thought this is really crazy because this is where I started. I got so wrapped up in doing all this stuff with celebrities and and all these advertisements and music videos. But where I really started was were these galleries in New York City. So he agreed to do it. And it it kind of put a, a new breath of life into him. He remembered the art. He remembered that there were other reasons to be doing photography. And I think he was just re-inspired more than anything. Mm -hmm. So he started looking into um, Renaissance art again, and he kind of reinvented himself and he did, well, these still lifes was one of his projects that he did after his time in Hawaii. So uh, for those of you listening, it's like a very typical old fashioned still life in some way, it's flowers, but they're rotting. So think Caravaggio, I see a lot of Caravaggio in this. It's like a dark, kind of moody background and there's fruit and flowers. But then if you look closer, there's a can of Ready Whip and a Jello mold and a plastic fork and it looks like a can of Pringles or something and a mm -hmm. weird mannequin face. He used these old styles, these still lives, to say new things, to talk about new things that were kind of plaguing our society. When I was researching David LaChapelle, one thing that really struck me, you can look at his pictures and you can see something very superficial. You can see lots of nudity and lots of saturated colors and lots of sets and bright lights and it's very glam but if you start to deconstruct it you can see that he's telling a very he's he's sharing a very earnest feeling about how he sees our world if you look at the symbolism it's about sexism it's about war it's about consumerism but he's showing it in his own way and what he said was that he wanted to he wanted to spread those messages he wanted to share his view but he wanted to make it pretty. He said, people want to look at things that are pretty, so I make it pretty, but have the real message. And I thought that that was really neat. So again, really inspiring to me because he puts so much work into each photo and he takes it so much farther than just pressing the shutter. But he also found a way to speak his mind, but make it appealing, make mm -hmm. it beautiful to look at. He will catch your eye and draw you in. And before you know it, you realize you're looking at something much deeper. And that's the reason that I love David LaChapelle. Yeah, he really is one of the most creative photographers ever and one of the best, most creative minds of our whole generation, I think. Yeah. A lot of respect for him. Yeah, we were fortunate enough. We were um, went to my mother's one night. We were thumbing through a local paper. And I looked and saw, oh, crap, this says David LaChapelle is speaking right down the street from us <laughs> in like how we missed 10 that. minutes. Yeah. And we just got in the car and we happened to head there you know, and to just to see him talk for, I think, like a half hour, 20 minutes. But the security guard let us in, even though we were late. We walk into the room. Yeah, we begged our way into a sold out David place. And it's David LaChapelle <laughs> in the front of the room. And what, what, were there like 40 people there? It was yeah. such a small room. And we were so fortunate to see him talk about his work. And it was really nice. He really inspired me. So these three photographers we looked at today, Mary Ellen gets to know subjects intimately and then takes mostly candid photos with that access in order to kind of give people insight into their lives. She lets she gives people a voice, kind of like an underprivileged people yeah. speak. Yuri, story. our curs on the other hand, cranking out stock photography that captures an image for other businesses to use in their imagery and making millions at it, but making fantastic work. And conveying a big story in, in a small picture. Yeah. You know? And uh and then David LaChapelle, who's creating almost traditional storytelling fine art with grandiose visions and huge stars. He's uh, insane. Taking weeks and weeks or months and months to craft each photo, but producing artwork that will definitely last uh, generations. Certainly. 
I hope that you all enjoyed this. I know that you're going to comment and say we forgot this person, that person, or the other. We did not. We'll do more of these in the future. But we welcome your suggestions. Yeah, yeah, we welcome your suggestions. And this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. It's the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, online store, or portfolio for you and your photos. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. If you want to see more like this, you can subscribe if you're watching YouTube. You can go to iTunes and subscribe as well. And you'll or keep... wherever you get your podcast, wherever pretty you much. Your... Yeah, wherever you get your podcast. Look up, picture this. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks.